we had the um, <clears throat> we had a meeting at the Planning and Zoning Commission. And uh, for those of you who are visiting or our guests today, you can ignore this part. <clears throat> but when we began, uh, we moved into this location. Uh, the people who owned the building told us, hey, there was a church that was here, and uh, we're almost done with getting your zoning changed, and uh, it'll be no time at all. And we haven't worked into our lease that they had to get it uh, changed. And uh, what we found out was almost done meant almost starting. Like they hadn't even, they hadn't even begun. <laughs> they hadn't even yet begun uh, to work on it. And, uh, and then one day the city showed up, and they're like, hey, you don't actually have zoning to be here. We're like, oh, no, no, we're, they're working on it. And they're like, yeah, no, they're not. And we're like, well, we, we need that to change. And so we've been in a process for way too long now. And uh, the last uh, hurdle before the city commission was to go before the planning and zoning commission to have them vote or something. And here's, here's something that was pretty cool. One of the people on the planning and zoning commission, uh, her mother-in-law was our inter head intercessor for like five years. <laughs> I felt like we were doing okay in that meeting. And uh, we, we actually, uh, <clears throat> they approved our uh, zoning change, uh, six to one. <clears throat> and we're praying for the seventh guy to get saved, amen? We're praying for him to get saved, amen. Uh, also, uh, <clears throat> this week I got back from Israel. I thank you all who were praying for me while I was gone. Uh, it was cold and it was wet and I was tired because it was seven hours difference and that really threw me off. So I appreciate you. Uh, praying for me. Uh, I went with a group called uh, Christians United for Israel, and I'm just going to be completely honest what happened. Uh, they take pastors there to see Israel, and here's what they do. I'm just going to be completely transparent with you. What they say is, listen, we will fly you to Israel, have you there for nine days, cover almost all of your meals, and it will only cost you $800. I said, sold! Sold, and in return, what they want is to use our facility to have a meeting for those who might want to support Israel politically, and uh, we'll have that one Sunday evening, and, and uh, we'll let them do it, and I was just like, absolutely, we're renting the place anyways, come on and use it, I will go to Israel. And so I went to Israel, and uh, saved about $3,000, and uh, glory to Jesus, and um, <clears throat> amen, I pray you all can go. I, I was, I've never been an Israel guy myself. If I can be honest with you, uh, Israel's not really uh, big on my prophetic radar, um, but it's amazing to see where Jesus walked, where stuff happened. It's just, it's neat. It's, uh, it's really neat. Uh, <clears throat> and I'll tell you more about this in dribs and drabs over the weeks, and if you have any questions, ask me. Uh, but here, here's one cool thing. When you come into the city of Jerusalem, um, the, the security situation is just terrible there. You know, they're surrounded by people who want to kill them. And consider, they, and they believe that God wants them to kill the Jews, right? Like, that's like part of their purpose. And, uh, and so um, there's a lot of tunnels into Jerusalem, so they don't have to go through neighborhoods uh, where people want to shoot at cars and throw rocks. And so you come into Jerusalem through this tunnel, and uh, as you go along, you come into the old city, and on your left is like this massive graveyard, right? It's, uh, just beyond it is the Mount of Olives. And uh, you, you're driving along, and you're like, oh, there's Absalom's tomb. There's the tomb of Zechariah. I mean, it's just, it's... it's we got Wayne Heisinger, <laughs> Zechariah, you know, it's just, it's just phenomenal. Uh, so appreciate you praying for me. Um, it, I think everybody should go, uh, especially if you have someone else pay your way. Uh, so if you got a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 12. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter. We are continuing our message series, Speaking Worlds. I hope you've enjoyed it thus far. I hope you're enjoying the devotion where we're seeing Jesus clearly. Have you, have, has it been good? I get worked up my own self watching it. I'm like, that's a good word, Carl. I preach my computer. I'm like, that's a good word, Carl. Preach that right there. That's good. I'm like, three minutes, not enough. Come on. Get that word going. I get all worked. I forget that I, what the devotions are sometimes. I'm like, that's good right there. Preach that. So, um, so Corey preached for me last week. Such a good word. Thank Corey for uh, doing that. It was good, yeah? Again, if I could be honest, I was in a meeting that I didn't really want to be in. And so I was watching the service on, while I was in my headphones, so I was considering it spiritual. So I was, I was with you in worship. And part of what Corey talked about at the beginning of his message, it was so powerful when he talked about ask, seek, knock. He talked about before that passage of Scripture, uh, Jesus told them that, you know, with, if, you're, if, you're, if your heart is not clean, God will not hear your prayers. And he talked so much about getting uh, our, our, how our heart uh, is important in our prayer life because our prayers and their efficacy 
is affected by our judgment. You remember Jesus was talking about, hey, you need to get, deal with your judgment before you start praying. Deal with your own heart issues before you start praying. Amen. Amen. So what, what happens in our heart is important. And, and, and I want to, if, if you get one thing out of the message today, I want to reiterate what I said two weeks ago. And your words are powerful. Your words matter. Amen. Your words are powerful. Amen. Now listen, it's cold in here this morning. I'm chilly willy, right? I'm, I'm not made for this. I have thin blood, and I was in Jerusalem, and it was 37 degrees and raining, and I was dying. I was literally becoming a solid because I was so cold, and I was there with pastors from like Maine, and they're like, this is not a big deal. I'm like, well, the devil's a liar. I'm freezing, right? And so it's cold in here, amen, and the way we're going to get a little warmer is you're going to be active in the service, amen. You're going to be engaged in the service, Amen. Thank you, Corey. Yes. Yes. I need you to say amen for you and your lost family members. Amen. amen. All right. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, 28 minutes. Okay, here we go. So Jesus said that our prayers are affected by our heart condition, our judgments. <clears throat> and I think as, as Christians, we believe this intellectually, but we don't believe it as a heart issue often enough. And I want to focus on this a little bit. Today, now, <clears throat> I am a Christian, which is good since I lead a church, right? I am a Christian, and, and as a Christian, I believe that Jesus is God. Amen. Amen. And so that means that he never has lied and never can lie. Amen. Yeah, he, he cannot lie. Every word he speaks is truth because he is truth, <clears throat> right? I am radical enough to believe that I believe what Jesus said literally. I believe the literal words of Jesus. Now, this gets me into trouble sometimes because when he said, you, this generation will see this, you know what I believe? That generation actually saw it because I believe that Jesus spoke the truth. He didn't speak an allegory. He actually spoke truth. You believe that? Matthew chapter 12, verse 37. These are the words of Jesus, our God. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words, you will be. Your words are powerful. They're so, so powerful. They're super, super powerful. Now, this word justified here means to be pronounced righteous, to be pronounced righteous. And he says, hey, the words we use have to do with the righteousness we walk in. And even more powerful, he says, by your words, you will be condemned. Now, condemnation or to be condemned means a final negative judgment. Once someone is condemned, that's the end. That's the end of the judgment. There's no appeals process. There's no one going back for another trial. There's no technicalities that you can get off. Condemnation is final and it's permanent. The Bible says once to die, then the judgment. We need to get this right here because there's no second chances. Amen we want a second chance we get a second chance the way we get the second chance is we mess up the first time we repent and we start over we get what's called a second birth us christians have a term for that we call it being born again amen born again we get a second chance we get to be born into righteousness that jesus christ provided for us by his death burial and resurrection amen. and our faith in him gives us new life amen and so, so this, this, this righteousness that's in our words or this condemnation that's in our words is super, super powerful. Now, if you want to know what kind of language happens in a family, talk to the kids. Talk to the kids because their self-worth will reflect what's being spoken over them in the home. Do they hope or do they doubt? Do they believe for better or do they believe for worse? Are they constantly correcting or are they speaking words of edification? Kids can't make this stuff up on their own. They reflect what's spoken at home. And so our words of judgment, they begin at home. We need to watch our words of judgment. It starts at home. Now, yes, that is important when we talk about children, but when we talk about starts at home, I'm talking about literally in your own heart. Our words of judgment begin at home. 
Now, this condemnation that I believe that Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 12, verse 37, I don't think we're talking about salvation here. I don't think we're talking about salvation because no one can make themselves righteous at all. It requires Jesus Christ. So the word does says, with the heart we believe, but with the mouth we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that's how we get saved. However, this condemnation I believe that many people walk in is created by their own words. Here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about today, we need to look at our negative self-talk. We need to look at our own negative self-talk because our words of judgment begin at home. For most of us, the biggest critic in our lives is our own selves. The biggest critic in our lives is our self. We're in a world that is starving for affirmation. Starving for encouragement. We're in a world that is starving for someone to speak life. Including our own self. Including our own soul. Our soul is starving for affirmation. And Jesus tells us to watch our words because they should be words of life. We should be speaking words of life. And that's not just for others, that's for ourselves. We need to be watching our negative self-talk. Now, <clears throat> this causes some people to get nervous when I talk like this. They start thinking like, oh, well, pastor, it's good to be humble. It's good to not think too much of ourselves. It's, it's good to... And then Jesus, actually, we can be humble and not condemn ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Condemnation is not humility. Condemnation is condemnation. Yeah. Pride is a sin. Amen. Yeah. So pride is a sin. The, 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 the answer to condemnation is not pride. Because pride is a sin, but so is condemnation. Condemnation is a sin just like pride. We're not allowed to judge ourselves. We're not allowed to condemn ourselves. We're not allowed to look at ourselves in a negative light because if you have received Jesus, anybody here received Jesus Christ their Savior? Has anybody here gotten saved? Because my Bible tells me if you got saved, you're a child of God. My Bible tells me that you were created in your Father's image. And so if you put yourself down, you're putting down the very creation that God made. We don't compliment God by tearing ourselves down. We don't tell Him that He's wonderful in all His creation by saying that what He created is awful. I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and so are you. The devil hates you, not because you're amazing, but because you look like your daddy. And you carry his voice. You carry the hope of God on the inside of you. You carry God's best on the inside of you, the Holy Ghost of God. That's why the devil hates you. And saying that you're terrible doesn't make you any closer to God. We need to be healthy. We need to be healthy. And this, this, this talk is going to make some people uncomfortable, and I'm okay with that because you're too comfortable with your own self-condemnation. You don't view it as a sin, and I hope today you do. I hope you see it as sin today. We need to stop being critical. We need to stop being critical even of ourselves. And it starts at home. It starts at home with our own self-talk. It starts with what we sit in bed and we think about at night. It talk, when, we, when we get this thought of what happened in the past and, and then it comes and tells us that we're awful, what do we do with that thought? What do we do with these words? What do we do with these judgments? What do we do with this bitterness? What do, what do we do? What do we do? Do we, do we entertain it or do we reject it as a lie? <clears throat> the Lord has been... Uh, He's been taking me on a journey, and I believe he's trying to take us somewhere. And um, I, there's a, a radical, radical word that he's been speaking to me that I'm going to put up. And before we put it up, I want you to just think about, like, I'm ready for the Lord to talk to me. How about you? Here's what the Lord has been teaching me. Be nice. The Lord is talking. Hey, be nice. The church can be nice. We can be nice. You're allowed to see. <clears throat> if you want to see what it looks like when we reject this notion, go hang out in the Middle East. In the Middle East, there's people who feel perfectly okay hating people. Hating people to the point where it's okay to teach your kids to hate them. Teaching your kids that it's okay to murder them. We'll sing songs about people being murdered. I mean, it, it, the, the whole area celebrates hatred, 
celebrates massacre. America is not far off. The politicians of today want you to feel okay hating people. And it is sin. It is sin. Hatred is sin. Jesus did not come and say, let's talk about who we can hate. I just, I feel like Jesus talked about love even when people hated them. Now listen, yeah, amen. <clears throat> this is so powerful. We need to get this. This is so powerful. Jesus knew he was going to be murdered by these people. And he told other people to love them. I don't love people who cut me off in traffic. And I'm supposed to love my murderer. This is the radical message of Jesus Christ. Don't trade it in for a political party. Don't trade it in for don't don't trade it in for personal freedom. Don't trade it in for economic gain. Like we, we like this is this is all we got. I'm not trading it for what man can accomplish. I'm, that's not even my message here. But listen, be nice. You gotta be nice to people, even people who lie about Jesus in the name of politics. We gotta be nice to people. We can't let them be liars and then we be mean to them because we can't, we can't blow up Twitter about them being awful in the name of Jesus. We can speak truth, but we got to be nice. We're not allowed to not be nice. Would you agree with me? So we need to be nice. Watch this, even to yourself. We got to be nice even to yourself. Even because you're not allowed to judge. If we've agreed that our words are powerful and we're not allowed to speak words of condemnation, then you're not allowed to speak it over yourself because you're a person. Not for nothing, it's not helpful either. We're not accomplishing anything with it. We're so desperate to have control over situations and our judgment doesn't help. We want to feel like we have ownership of it. We want to feel like we have power over it. We want to feel like it's not getting away from us. So we begin speaking words of judgment and regret and it doesn't actually help. It's a lie. It's like grabbing a vapor. <clears throat> and so we would agree today that there are power in our words. Amen? Do you believe that? I believe there's power in our words. And too often Christians only get far enough in believing this that they believe what they're not supposed to do. But let's take it the next step and be real Christians and believe what we are supposed to do. And if there are power in our words, therefore we're not supposed to be, speak words of condemnation and judgment. That means we are supposed to speak words of life. And so if there's power in our words today, I have a radical proposition. Why don't we use that power today to change our life? Why don't we use the power God has actually given us to change our lives? Instead of speaking words of judgment over ourselves, how about we start speaking words of encouragement, words of power, words of hope, words of comfort? Words of life. No more death speaking life over our own soul. It kind of feels a little crazy to speak condemnation over our own body, doesn't it? It's just kind of crazy to burn down your own house to spite the neighbor. This is the only life we have. What do you want this life to look like? How about we start speaking that over our life? How about we start, start using our words to create a world we actually want to live in? Yeah. We need to be aware of the words we speak over ourselves. We need to be aware of the words that we allow to fly through our mind. We need to be aware of the thoughts that come. We need to be aware of everything that comes and tries to come into our, our heart. We need to be aware of these things. And way too many people in today's world are not even aware of what's going on internally. Have you ever talked to somebody who's just not aware of how they present? And you have to say things like, stop yelling. I'm trying to have a conversation with you. Please stop yelling. I'm not yelling. You are. Back up, please. Let's just suave. Just bring it back a little bit here. They're just completely unaware with how they Present. Or you speak to somebody and they completely withdraw from the conversation. Oh, no, 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 whatever you want. No, 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 I'm trying to ask you what you want. No, 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 no. Are you aware that you're running in fear right now? Like, can we be aware of our own emotions? And I want to speak over you today that God created you to be the master of your own heart. Amen. That thing is not going to run away from you. You can master it today. You can master your heart. You can master your emotions. You can master your life. 
You are not without any tools and without the ability to master what's going on internally. Now, I know the world says that, you know, you cannot get over anxiety or you cannot get over depression unless I, I, I understand all that and I understand the need for medicine. I get that. I also understand that we live in the world that we create with our words. And so I have another radical proposition for you today that you may have heard or you may not have heard. Watch this. You don't have to believe every thought that pops in your head. Leave this up for me, Andres. You don't have to believe every thought that pops in your head. What does that mean? <clears throat> that means if something pops in your head that is not encouraging, doesn't build you up, wants to drag you back in the old drama, you don't have to actually engage it. I don't know if you have this, but on my phone, uh, I have this, uh, this AT&T call protect thing. I'm, I'm sure lots of people have that, letter, a lot of carriers have that. This AT&T call protect lets me know when a telemarketer is calling. And I have mine set up that if a telemarketer comes, it just doesn't even ring, right? Right? And sometimes it'll say, possible telemarketer. You know what I do when it says that? I don't answer. Yeah. I don't argue with them to tell them I'm not interested. I don't answer. Yes. Just because they want to talk to me does not mean I have to talk to them. Yes. Are you getting this? Are you getting this? Just because a thought pops in your head... Do you remember in ninth grade when you said that stupid thing and everybody looked at you and you follow down that hole again of self-loathing? Oh, remember that time you sneezed and you got snot all over the person next to you and you just, you want to die all over again? You, I mean, and you want to start arguing with it. No, no, no. It wasn't that big a deal. It was a long time ago and people remember, now I was a kid and, or, or, or the condemnation comes and you start arguing. No, no, no. Uh, in the name of Jesus, I'm free. And you start arguing. No, no, no. You don't have to entertain those thoughts. Here's where we want to get. This is what we're looking for. This is where we're trying to get as a people. And I believe this is going to set some people free today. What we want to do is we want to be aware of ourselves and the things that come in our head. And we want to see these thoughts come and we want to look at them and not engage them and let them pass by. This is what we're looking for. You do not have to engage every thought that pops in your head. <clears throat> don't argue with it. And watch this. Don't judge yourself for having the thought. Your judgment ties you to the thing you judge. That's what Jesus taught us. If you're in judgment of someone, you're tying yourself to them. And you don't get free until you forgive. Someone sins against you, you're tied to them until you forgive them. Who do you want to drag around in your life? Who do you want to walk life with? Keep judging people because you are living life with them. You're allowing them to live in your head. These are not people I want living in my head. I didn't like them the first time I met them, right? I don't want them around that long. Is that, can I, is that all right to say that? That's just. And so Jesus is like, listen, you want them out of your life? Forgive them. Give them to me. I'll take care of it. You move on with your life. And so the offense comes. You say, I forgive you. Going on with my life now. We need to take control of what's happening between our ears. We need to take control of what's happening in our heart. And so as you begin to get aware of the thoughts popping in your head, you begin to get aware of the things that you're thinking and the thoughts you're entertaining, you're going to begin to notice some things. You're going to notice that when these lies come, your breathing starts to get a little more erratic. Your heart starts to pound. You get a little more tense. Maybe your volume raises a little bit. These are all symptoms of you entertaining lies. Lies of condemnation, lies of judgment, lies of there's a threat coming. What you're going to do in the future is you're going to notice these symptoms and you're going to say to yourself, not, oh, I'm under attack or, oh, what was me? These things are happening. You're going to say, no, 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 I control what's happening in my body. I'm going to breathe slow. I'm going to look for the thought and I'm going to let it pass by. <laughs> I'm going to let it pass by. Amen? Yeah. You don't have to entertain it. You don't have to have it over for dinner. You don't have to create an argument against it. You don't have to write an essay toward it. You don't have to sing it a song or read it the Bible. You can just tell it. You can just move on now. I'm moving on with my life. Be nice to yourself. Stop judging yourself for having bad thoughts. Let them go. You start judging yourself over the thoughts. You tie yourself to the thoughts. Let them go. Be nice to yourself. You need it. And so someone would say to me, 
as a critic, you know, Pastor, we need the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You're telling people not to respond to Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not here to, to, to condemn you. Yeah. Words of condemnation are not from God. Yeah. Oh, you're an idiot, or you messed things up, or that was so stupid, or things are not going to work out. Oh, the calamity is going to come. Oh, financial ruin is going to come, or things aren't going to work out. None of those are the voice of God. None of those are the voice of God. God may come and say, listen, you understand where the sin is taking you, right? Like, I've called you to something better than what you're doing right now. This is not going to build what you're trying to build in your life. You need to stop doing this. This is what conviction looks like. And right now, I want to give a voice of conviction that says, stop judging yourself at sin. I want you to hear me when you sit there and you wallow in your self-pity over how terrible things are. I want you to say, wait a minute, this is sin. I need to stop this thought pattern and take control of my life. Paul knew I was going to preach this, so he put this scripture in the Bible. In Philippians chapter 4, watch this. This is what he says. He says, finally, Carl, whatever is true, whatever, you need to put your name in the Bible. Brethren, he's talking to you. When Mike Rentler and the GO team go out witnessing the people, they, they literally write on the Bible, and they take out words, and they put people's names. For God so loved Sarah that he sent his only son to die on a cross. Like, it's got to be real, amen? He died on the cross for Carl, not for whosoever, for Carl. Right? It's got to be real. So finally, you, watch this. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Dwell on these things. Well, you're like, oh, pastor, you don't understand. I can't pay the rent. So you're telling me there's nothing positive to dwell on? Well, you don't understand. My mama did me wrong. Wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. He's like, he's like he's, at the end here, he's like, look, if you can't find it, make something up. Find something good to meditate on. Just find something to meditate. And here's what's so important. I want you to read this, uh, this chapter. The, 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 the verse after in Philippians 4, 9, don't go there now, but Philippians 4, 9 says, if you do these things, then the God of peace will be with you. We like to yell the Bible at the enemy, but he says, listen, if you start meditating on the positive things, guess what? Peace will dwell with you. It's not that complicated. When you dwell on chaos, you live with chaos. And so if we take the whole scripture in context, in verse 7, he's like, listen, if you got issues, all things with prayer and supplication. Dwell on positive things. Then the God of peace will be with you. If you're spending your time judging yourself and meditating on the bad report and what could go wrong and catastrophizing every situation, and the whole world is going to fall down around me. Now, I know you don't use those words, but we think that way. Let's be honest. Someone's going to leave you or your kids are not going to come back to Jesus or your finances aren't going to work out. If you're constantly empowering these thoughts, then don't be upset that the God of peace is not dwelling with you. We're living in the world we created with our words. We don't want to deny reality. We do not want to deny reality. But these things are reality as well. Are they getting equal time in your brain? Is only the negative reality getting power from you? Is this getting empowered by you? Because this will choke out the lie. <clears throat> we need to be less judgmental of ourselves. We need to be less judgmental. We need to, um, we need to allow and actively partner with God's word to change our lives and the world of the people around us. Jesus didn't say, I send you out into the world, you better figure out how to change it. He's like, you better come up with a plan and some NGOs and, and try to come up with some programs. No, no, no. He sent us out there with his word. Let's use the power of our words to change our lives. Let's use the power of our words to change our lives. Amen. 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 I think I have a slide that says that. <laughs> Let's use the power of our words to change our lives.
There's constant enemies to our faith, though. It constantly feels like we're being under attack by the enemy, by attack by this world. The very systems of our society are at odds with our faith. And in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus wants to let his disciples know, like, hey, listen, this isn't just me teaching you. Like, you need to start walking in something. You ever felt like you weren't quite ready for the test, the battle, the situation? Like, I just want to be a kid for a little longer. And Jesus is like, time to step out the boat. Time to get out the boat. <clears throat> so disciples were living with him, and he's like, it's time to be big boys. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 7, Jesus says this. As you go, us Pentecostals love this scripture. As you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. We love, love this part. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out devils, empty hospitals, Take over nations. Freely you've received. Freely give. And we say amen to that, right? We like Pentecostals. We love, love, love and believe that scripture. I haven't raised the dead yet, but I've seen all the rest yet. But let's look at verse 7, what this all predicates on. As you go, speak words. This is what Jesus said. As you go, speak words. Preach the gospel. Literally, he's like, as you go out from me and you speak what you've seen and you heard, you are creating an atmosphere of the miraculous. You are creating a world where anything can happen. I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves, he said. And I felt that way. I felt like we're sheep in the midst of wolves, but we're not. We're not sheep among wolves. We actually have power. This is what intercession is about. Intercession is us hearing God's word, and we speak it back to him in agreement. That's what intercession is. Intercession is not begging God in tears on your knees. That's not intercession. You may do that in intercession, but that's not intercession. Intercession is not screaming. Though you may scream in intercession, and I encourage it uh, highly. Intercession does not mean we're singing for a long time. Intercession does not mean we're worshiping 24 hours a day. Intercession means I have heard what God said about a situation, and I am speaking it into the atmosphere. Now, I may do it 24 hours a day with music. I may do it jumping around the room. I may do it inside, outside, in the dark, in the light. But intercession is literally speaking the word of God over situations. That is intercession. Like, I, 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 we, I got a bad report from someone this week, and I just spoke back. I am just believing the Lord Jesus Christ for a different report coming from the doctor in the name of Jesus. Like, I am speaking the word over you because I know that's not God's plan for your family. This is what we do in the burning room. In the burning room, we just train people. You're going to hear God's voice, and you're going to learn to speak it over situations, starting right here in this room and all over Boca Raton, South Florida, to the end of the world. Amen? Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 10, verse 27, I believe. Yeah, Matthew 10, 27. He says, what I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light. And what you hear whispered in your ear, Preach it on the mountaintops. Here's what I like about this scripture. That means you're going to hear him. He didn't say if you hear. He didn't say if I tell you. What I tell you. What you hear. That's a promise of God for your life, that you will hear the word of God over every situation that you're in, and he will empower your words that you speak over it. Amen. 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 Come on, amen. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light. I don't think he's talking about spiritual darkness there. I believe he's talking literally when you're praying at night. But also, when you don't see him in that situation, when you're in the midst of that financial ruin, when you're in the midst of that family struggle, when you're in the midst of that, that, that trial and you don't know what's going on, and it feels like you're in darkness, and when the Lord Jesus speaks, that's the truth that you repeat. That's what comes out of your mouth. Not, oh, woe is me, not things are going to work out terribly, or the world's going to come to an end, or this is, I'm going to fail. No, 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 no. Jesus said, I'm, I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. He said, I'm above and not beneath. I'm the head and not the tail. The Lord spoke it to me in this situation. I'm believing God. 
You need to hear God in your situation. Don't, don't, you can't just quote what you heard someone else say. We need to hear God and speak it over our situation. Here's what needs to happen. We need to get in that situation and we need to hear God and we let the word of God cook in the furnace of faith. And in the furnace of faith, that word of God comes to life and then we release it to the world. I, I, I just, amen. If I learned anything in Israel this week, if I learned anything in Israel this week, we had this, uh, this tour guide, this, this, this girl, brilliant young girl. <clears throat> she, was, uh, she grew up in America and uh, she came from a Jewish family and wound up moving to, wow. Wound up moving to Israel. This girl, like, we were in the city of David and she was just quoting all this scripture over where we're at. And I'm like, man, hearing the word of God from someone else ain't enough. You need faith to come and make that alive on the inside of you. I'll tell you this. <clears throat> she said, uh, listen, here's my story. I'm, I'm Jewish. I grew up in a Jewish home, and uh, we weren't very religious. And then I came to Israel for a birthright tour and, and uh, fell in love with the place. She married an, an Israeli man who's in the army. And uh, she's like, but I'm Jewish, and so leave me alone. Basically saying, I know there's a group of pastors. Don't witness to me. I'm like, well, listen to you or listen to Jesus. I'm not sure which one I'm going to go. I think I'm going with Jesus. And so as she's, uh, you know, as, as they give us these tours, and they're like, we're standing in the city of David, and you're looking, there's the uh, Mount of Olives, there's the temple, and she's talking about how this is David, and we're looking at the Kidron Valley, and this is going to happen, and the Messiah is going to come down this road right here, and he's going to go in through that gate, and I'll be like, you know, that actually happened. I don't know if you know that actually happened. The Messiah actually came, and he actually walked down that hill right there, and he walked into that gate right over there where he was persecuted and died, and guess what? He's not dead. He actually rose again from the dead. I understand you've been witness to, but I got to speak the word of faith that came through my heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, listen, listen. Matthew 12. Let's look at it one more time, and then we're going to say some things. Whoa. Matthew 12, 37. Look. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words... You will be condemned. What are you going to choose today to do with your words? What are you going to choose getting out of here? Stand with me if you would. What are we going to do today? I am here to let you know that God has empowered your words to change your world. He has given you the authority and the power to change not only what goes through your head, what goes through your heart and goes through your family. Can you say amen? He has given you authority over the storms in your life. He wants you to use, mm, he wants you to use those words to change your life. Now listen, two weeks ago we said some declarations. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? I want you to say a couple of them today. And we're going to declare them in faith. Amen. Amen. Are you ready? Do you believe that God has given you power? We're going to say three or four of these today. We have them in the, in the lobby again. You can take them home, quote them over yourselves, declare them over yourselves, and let's just believe that God is going to change lives today. Amen. Amen. Are you ready? First one, are you ready? Are you ready? Ready? Let's say it together. I set the course for my life today with my words. Amen. Come on. Number two. Ready? Ready? Go. I declare today that I cannot be defeated, discouraged, depressed, or disappointed. Number three. Ready? Ready? Go. I am the head. I have insight. I have wisdom. I have ideas. I have authority. Come on. Give a shout. Number four. As I speak God's promises, they come to pass. They feel all attacks, assaults, oppression. Give a shout. Last one. Let's declare it over our lives. God is on my side today, and therefore I cannot be defeated. Give a shout. Give a shout. Father, let it be done in our lives. Amen.
Thank you. Come on, let's give it up for the word this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, just thank him. Thank him. Thank you, Jesus. We love you this morning. We love you. There's nobody like you. It's a good day to be alive. Amen, church. This week, just want to, I want to uh, give you a couple things to leave with. This week, we're continuing our 21, our 28 days of devotion. This week, life groups are starting. Amen. During first service, as we were ending service, I just saw, I just saw a launch pad, like a ramp, and I just felt like God, this in this in this time of devotion and. And, and, and what God's been doing at the beginning of the year, I just felt like he was launching us into 2020. How many of you, how many of you know this is going to be a good year? Yeah. Amen. But here's what I want to leave you with today. As you go, pick up the declaration page if you haven't already. And in the morning as you speak these declarations out, it's going to give you faith to actually speak and declare God's promises in your life during the day. It's going gonna, it's gonna to give you the courage and the faith and the boldness to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever you go. Amen. So I want to charge you this week to speak the gospel. Bring good news wherever you go. Invite people to church. Tell them what Jesus has done for you. Can we do that this week? Amen. Come on, let's give it up for Jesus one more time. Now, ministry team, if you would come forward, if you need prayer in your body for anything, if you're, you, you, maybe you've been fighting a cold or maybe you're out of work or I, I don't know what it is. Maybe your pinky toe was stubbed last night and you're just tired of it hurting. There's, it's, there's nothing too small. There really isn't. We got a ministry team up here. You can come forward now, ministry team, who would love to pray for you. So do not leave here without getting prayer. Amen. Hey, say hello to somebody you didn't come with this morning. Let's give it up for Jesus one more time and we'll see you guys next week. Have an amazing Sunday.